Are we good? All right, there we go. All right, good morning. Hey, can we give a round of applause to our worship team? Uh, there's nothing really beautiful when someone's willing to use their spiritual gift to glorify the body, the Christ, us right here. And so um, thank you guys for what you guys do and the way you lead us. Um, but I just want to say uh, welcome. Good morning, Boulder Mountain. It is an honor to be here with you this morning. My name is Michael, um, and uh, your pastor, Kyle, is actually on a bike ride this week. He decided to travel all the way to the state of Iowa, and he is on a 500-mile bike ride across the entire state. Um, I'm going to say that again, 500 miles. So if your pastor has ever needed your prayer more than ever, it's, it's right now. So, uh, but yeah, be praying for him throughout this week, uh, just that um, he's doing it with another uh, pastoral friend of his and that he just sees God's creation, hears God's voice, and just comes back to your church to shepherd with this, this new uh, fire in his soul. So, uh, as I said, my name is Michael. Um, I'm actually just passing through in this season of life to another state. I'm going to be moving to California here, but in the past month, I've been able to be a part of your church. And there's something really special about Boulder Mountain. Um, there's something intimate about it. There's something where you guys give and you serve and you share with one another. And I just want to encourage you, uh, continue to do that. Fight the good fight. Um, be there for one another. Encourage. Allow each other to grow in your spiritual maturity. And God is doing something special here, not only in this church, but also in this community. So I just wanted to say, uh, well done. Uh, but as I said, I'm traveling through. I actually just returned from the country of South Africa. Um, I just spent actually the past four years there or so in South Africa working for the organization you just heard about a few weeks ago called Orchard Africa. Um, I just want to say thank you to Boulder Mountain for you guys' partnership and your friendship in that. Um, I want you to know lives are being changed each and every day in South Africa because of the partnership that you guys have formed with us. Um, we have a group of hundreds and hundreds of pastors in South Africa that receive community mentorship training as they lead their church in some of the most vulnerable places on the face of this planet. Um, because of you and your partnership, kids every single day receive a warm meal that they probably wouldn't have got elsewhere. Um, I want you to know also um, kids are able to attend school, preschools at a very young age uh, when they probably wouldn't have been able to afford it if it wasn't for your partnership. Um, I want you to know that adults in that community are receiving life skills training so that one day they can provide for their family and they aren't as vulnerable as they are right now. And most importantly, we just started a new program called our Women Empowerment Program, um, where we take a group of women through a year-long course where we help them rediscover their identity in Christ, that they are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we walk with them, and we get to see life change happen. They're, they're living in some of the most vulnerable, um, desperate situations right now. And as they go through this year-long course with Orchard Africa, we see them at the end of the year start new businesses, have new hope, see their identity in Christ and not their environment. And it's one of the most beautiful things. So I just want to say thank you, Boulder Mountain, for your partnership with Orchard Africa. But if you would, pull out your Bibles. We are going to dive into today's message. Um, and I just actually want to kind of share a little bit about it. Um, about a year ago or so, a really good friend and mentor of mine, Mike Tessendorf, actually the founder of Orchard Africa, he shared this passage with me. And it's Isaiah 58. And for some reason, this passage was, um, it's just like, it's one of those passages that grabs you. And I didn't know why. And I was so excited about it. And I shared it with the people around me. And they weren't as excited as I was. And I was like, why? Why are you not excited? This should grab your heart. And I've wrestled with that for the past year. And literally throughout the weeks, I would just pull up this verse, this passage, and I would read it and I would study it. But I didn't know why God was giving it to me, why my heart was so drawn to it. But now that I return, I think, and today, I think I finally know why. But I want to preface this today's message with two things. One, there's this idea of two words. It's the word of logos, and it's the word of rhema. And maybe you've heard of the word logos. It's a Greek word. It's the translation for actually the word. And in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Greek translation is, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And what is the Logos? The Logos is the written word of God. 
And the reason God gave us the word and word from the beginning to the end of the cover of our Bible is so that he could create order. He could create meaning. He could provide form and purpose in this world. But now there's another part of it. We have the word, we have the logos, the word of God that he gave us, but we also have something called the rhema. And the rhema is a Greek word that talks about the inspired word of God. And we see that in John 6, 63, the verse that says, in, it is in the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing, and the words which I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. And in Ephesians 5, 26, it says that he might sanctify her, cleansing her by the washing of the water in the word. And a lot of times when we read that second verse, what we think about, we think of the blood of Christ. And yes, the blood of Christ covered us from all our sin. So one day we can be reunited with our God. But more importantly than that, in this verse of Ephesians, it's talking about cleansing her with the washing of the word. And what that means is it means that when we continue to dive into scripture, the Holy Spirit will convict us and lead us. He will inspire us of that word. Maybe for... Some of us, there's been a time in our life where there was a scripture we read, and it was like God was speaking right to us. It was like, God, you must have knew everything that was on my heart. That just spoke right to me. And there might be another season of life where that same scripture didn't speak that same thing to you. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's the conviction of God. And that's how he inspires us. And that's why God's word never expires. But I want to remind one thing real quick. And that's, there's a difference between conviction and shame. Conviction is God going, God, wow, I read this scripture. My heart's been changed. God, you've broken my heart for what breaks yours. The scales have fallen off my eyes as it talks about in Paul's conversion. And it goes, God, I'm going to repent from what I was doing wrong. And I'm going to walk back into alignment in what you design. Your holiness, your creation. Shame is different. Shame is from the evildoer, the enemy. Shame is, well, you sinned last week. How can you come to church on a Sunday and praise God? Michael, what you thought three days ago, how could you be up here and teach the word of God? That's not of God. That's of the enemy. God gives us conviction through the Holy Spirit that says, God, reveal to me a new heart. Cleanse my heart, God, and allow me to repent from what I was doing wrong now that I've seen your truth, and I'm going to turn and walk in the right direction of your holiness. And so as we dive into Isaiah 58 today, I want to preface it with a little bit. We're going to get into it, and we're going to read it here in just a minute. But God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Israel. And we learn in the book of Zechariah that after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the people of Israel fasted on the fifth and the seventh month for 70 years. And they were crying out to God in Isaiah 58, God, 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 why don't you see us? But the thing is, God in Isaiah 1 had given them instructions on what they were supposed to do. He said in Isaiah 1, you're supposed to rescue the oppressed. You're supposed to defend the widows and orphans, and you're supposed to care for the hurting. But they forgot about this, and they continued on, and they continued in their own way. And they get all the way 70 years later to Isaiah 58, and they're going, God, God, why don't you see us? And God goes, I've already told you. And so if you would, open up your Bibles to Isaiah 58. It's a long verse or a long passage, but it's important that we read it. And it's going to set up today for us. It says in verse 1, God says, Cry loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, and declare to my people their transgressions, and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that has done righteousness. And has not forsaken the ordinance of their God. They ask me for just decisions. And they delight in the nearness of God. And the people of Israel respond. They say, why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? And God says, behold, on the day of your fast, you find your own desires. And oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. It is a fast like that which I choose, a day for man to humble himself. It is the bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed. Will you call this the fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? 
Is it not the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? And when we see the naked, to cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like a dawn and your recovery will be speedily and spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from the midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like a midday. And the Lord will continuously guide you and satisfy the desires in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath the delight, the holy day of the Lord acceptable and honorable, and honor it, not seeking your own ways, from seeking your own pleasures and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." I know that was long, but it's important that we allow God's word to lay out in front of us and allow it to wash over us. And so if we can just take some time to go into prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son. God, we just come before you with open hearts today. And God, would we just open our hearts to this place of that we just put down pride and ego and thinking we know what we know, God, and would we just allow your word to wash over us in a way that allows our, our, our hearts to turn, to see the world in the way you designed it and not in the way that we desire. And so God, the same way you spoke to the, the Israelites, would you speak to us today in that same way? God, if there's something in our heart that we're carrying, would we open that up to you and say, God, this is yours? And so, God, we ask for your rhema, your inspiration of your word to convict our hearts so that we don't leave here today the same we came in. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon us. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, my guess is, because I know it's happened to me, there's been some time in your life where you have received a message from a bank, an institution, a business that said this. There's been a breach in our security system. Your account is at risk. Go change your password. We all got that? Any of us ever get those? <laughs> or maybe you have told someone to, something to someone that you trusted, someone you, you, you really believed had your best interest, and then maybe a week or a month later, you heard that same thing come from someone else. You would likely say, there's been a breach in the system, or my trust with you is broken. In the ancient days, when they would build a city, they would build a wall around the city. And a lot of times, the first thing they would actually do sometimes, before they even established the city, they would build a wall. And the reason they would build the wall is to protect them, right? They would want to keep what is good in and what is bad out. And another way to say it, they want to keep what is holy in and what is evil out. There's a reason why you and I lock our front doors, right? It's because we cherish what is inside of the house, right? And if we left our front door open or if we left a hole in the fence around our house, we would likely say our home is vulnerable. And when the city is breached or broken in the ancient times, the people inside it become vulnerable. And in verse 1 through 5, God is saying to the ancient people, there has been a breach in your city wall. He says the people have become corrupted. And in James 1.27, the verse says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for the orphans and the widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. At the beginning, I told you guys why I thought maybe God had put this on my heart. 
After four years of spending time outside the country, I've re-entered back into the United States just a little over a month ago. And I think now more than ever, I'm seeing this huge division in our country. There's a huge division in people, in politics, from the left and the right, there's a division. In race, just two years ago, we are burning down cities and judging people from the left and the right. There's an attack on religion in our faith. If someone's different from us, we immediately devalue them. There's this huge division from one side to the other, and we've allowed culture to influence. And the truth is this, everyone. The cities we live in are broken. The social norms we have are broken. The governmental systems we have are broken. The political systems we have are broken. Our culture is broken. Can I get an amen? <laughs> And however, even though this might all be true, God is still saying, you can be a repairer of the beach around you. God has given us city walls. It's the word of God. It's the logos. God has given us his word of instructions on how to build a city wall around us, how to protect us and our families, how to keep us in alignment with who God is and what he has for us, to keep us safe, to keep us holy. But for far too long, we've ignored these things. The protective measures that are supposed to keep us close to God, we have ignored. The traditions and the customary things that are supposed to provide protection to us and our families, with our marriages, the sacred thing of marriage, what fatherhood is supposed to look like, how we treat our spouses, the gift, the sacred gift of intimacy and sex with one person the way we run our businesses and the way our society should look, we have ignored all of these customary things that we deemed important before. We have allowed the world, the unholiness of the world to begin to influence us. And we have lost the values that we originally deemed were important. But here's the deal, for today's message, I'm not talking about the whole world and I'm not even talking about the US. I think God in this verse, he's talking about something a lot smaller. He's talking about us in our personal lives. For far too long, we have been holding on to the things that are killing our families. Things we don't even realize it. They're tearing our families apart. Things like addictions. We act like they don't have an influence on us, but they do. Things like the use of pornography and lust. Infidelity. Caring about what others say more than what God's word says. We have this desire for money that we value over just time with our family. And we're willing to give up the time with our family so that we can make more of it. We've been holding on to a heart of bitterness and anger. Not forgiving those that have wronged us, but even worse, not seeking forgiveness from those that we have wronged. And we act like these things don't have an impact, but the truth is... You and I both know they do. And even if you don't believe it and you don't want to see it, I promise you, those around you do. In verse 12, God says, Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And God is saying this. He's saying, my people need to be repairers of the breach. He's not saying the government, or he's not even saying a political party, and he's certainly not saying a social movement. God wants you and he wants me to be the repairs of the walls around us. God is saying you will be a restorer of the streets around you, in your personal life, in your intimate walk with God. You'll be a restorer of the streets in your homes. You'll be a restorer of the streets with your spouse, with your children, in the families around you, in your workplaces, and in, in your friendships. God didn't say the government will, and he didn't say a political leader will, or even your pastor. He said, you will be the repairer of the breach. And so many times people come to church once a week looking for a quick fix, for a message that will solve all their life's problems. But it won't. And the reason it won't is because it starts with you. Each and every one of us, we have to be willing to go, God, what is your word? 
What is your inspiration of that word? God changed my heart, and how do I realign my life back to walking with you? For far too long, we have allowed this idea that we can separate secular and sacred. But here's the deal. There's only one thing in life that's guaranteed, and that is death. The mortality rate in life is hovering right around 100%. Never dropped lower, it's never gone over. But the one thing that's true is that one day, each and every one of us is going to pass. And on that day, more than likely, we're going to be buried about six feet in the ground. And they're going to put a nice plaque on our grave. And on that plaque, it's going to read our name. It's going to read our birth date. It's going to have a dash, and it's going to read our death date. And if we're really lucky, if we're really nice, our family might put a quote on it that says, like, he really loved fishing or was the best baker in the world. But the truth is this. None of those things are the most important thing on that grave. The most important thing on that grave is the dash between our birth date and our death date. And that dash represents our legacy. And that represents who we were as a person. You see, one day we're all going to pass, and the people we knew, the hundreds of people that we knew throughout our life, they'll forget on, about us, and they'll move on with their lives, and they'll pass themselves. But the people closest to us, like our children and our grandchildren, those are the ones that are going to remember us. And one day someone's going to ask your son or your daughter, or the people closest to you, what were they like? And they're going to respond and go, well, my dad was a good man. He worked a nine to five. He loved his pickup trucks. He liked to go fishing. And that's going to be their memory of you, your legacy. Or someone's going to ask your son or daughter, what was your dad like? My dad? Oh, my dad was different. I remember every time I went over to his house for a holiday, he would say, come on, son, come over here. And he'd take me away from everybody, and he'd go in a room, and he said, son, I just want to pray over you. I just want to pour out God's love over you. I want to remind you of his promise over your life. We get to choose what kind of legacy we want to live, that we want to live on. And the big question is today, how do I decide what that legacy is? How do I become a repairer of the breach around me? So in verse 1 through 11, God is talking about our worship. He's telling the Israelites, talking about their worship, He's saying, what is your worship to God? And they're talking about how they fasted and how they went to the temple daily. And most of the time when we think about worship, we think about the adoration of God. We think about singing worship songs and we think about raising our hands and we think about dancing and clapping and giving praise to God. And yes, those things are worship. They're an act of worshiping God. But in the verses of Isaiah, God is talking about something far beyond that. He's talking about the way we live out our lives each and every day. The way we live out our Christian life is our act of worship. In Romans 12, 1, it says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will and what is good and pleasing and perfect to him. The truth is, we must re-examine what we deem to be our worship. What is my worship? What am I worshiping in my life? Because worship is more than an outward appearance. Worship is how we live our lives each and every day. A good question to ask yourself, does my Monday through Saturday match my Sunday best? Because in Romans 1, that verse there, it said, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In this passage, God isn't talking about worship songs. God is talking about how we present our bodies as a way of life to those around us. Does my personal Life actually match my private life. Does the way I treat my spouse in public match the way I treat my spouse at home? The way I lead my wife and my children? The way I treat people around me? 
the way I care for those in need, the way I act at work around people, the way I respond to people in difficult situations. Does my private life match my public life? In verse 3 of 58, the people of Israel are angry at God because he hasn't responded to their acts of worship and sacrificing. They are crying out to God and are mad at God for not listening. God says, you do all the Christian things, saying, doing, acting. He says they come to the temple daily. They listen to the word as if they obey it. How anxious they were to worship God in front of others. They say, we have fasted in front of you, God. Why do you not see? Why have you turned your face from me? And in verse four, God responds, he says this, you have been living in evil pleasures and you keep oppressing your workers. You keep mistreating and devaluing the people around you. In Matthew 15, eight, Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The people looked like they had it all together. But far away, when they were away from the temple, they didn't represent a holy God at all. They were complaining to God, look at what we're doing. And God said, I'm looking for something far different. The word worship is actually an old English word that means to give worth to. But the problem with the Israelites is their motives were to benefit themselves. They were wearing sackcloth and ashes to show off their mourning. But they kept on oppressing the people around them, their workers. They were worshiping God so he would do something for them. But God said this, that's not what I do. Their worship was hollow and without spiritual substance. But then the big question is, okay, Michael, what does a life of true worship look like? And the thing is, we must understand worship is not what about, not what we want, but about what God wants in our lives. God is focused on ministering to the needs of those, the poor, the hungry, the oppressed, the hurting, the lost. In Matthew 25, the Lord says, I will separate my sheep from my goats. The thing is, the church is not a club for the healthy. It's a hospital for the sick. And each one of us, are that hospital's patients if we're willing to open our hearts and let ourselves be. The church is about a community of vulnerable people that say, this is who I am, this is the real me. Walk with me, teach me, guide me, put people around me that are all going through the same thing so we can learn to walk in better maturity with who God has called us to be. It's about spiritual maturity, spiritual growth. A life of worship is not just upwards, it's actually outwards. A life of worship lifts the burdens of heavy yokes upon each other. True worship is to free people and not burden them. A life of worship is to feed the hungry. It's to bring the homeless into our house and shelter them. I know so many times it's easy for us to say, when we come across the problem, I think there's a nonprofit, there's there's that shelter on, on 53rd Avenue, right? But yet we have an empty bedroom in our home that we're going home to. A life of worship engages with the suffering of a fellow human being. A life of worship removes oppressive behavior towards others. It lifts bondages and burdens towards others. A life of worship is giving ourselves to satisfy the souls of the afflicted. But you might be asking yourself this question. How do I do this? Well, you start small. You become a repairer of the breach to the things closest to you. That's where your legacy begins. You might not be able to fix the government, the politics, the social norms, or fix the culture, but what you can do is you can become a repair of the breach to the city walls around you, in your home, at work, in your friendships, in our church, in this community of Boulder Mountain. We do this first. We become a repair of the breach of ourselves. We look inwards at ourselves first, and the first thing we do is we need to read and memorize the word. We open the word and we go, God, this is your word. What are you teaching me? And it's not so you can show off. It's so that when you encounter someone who's hurting, that needs to know that word, 
you can actually share it with them. So many times people are afraid to actually share the love of Christ and tell them about scripture because they actually don't know it. So you open the word and you learn and you memorize over it. You pray and you practice intimate time with God each and every day. In the morning, at night, as you're driving at work, whatever the case may be, you practice intimacy with God. You put a biblical community around you, people that are going to strengthen you, people that encourage you with their faith. You find an accountability partner. If you're struggling with something, you find someone who's a trusted friend so that when that temptation comes to you, when you're struggling with that, you call them up and you say, hey, I just want you to know this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I'm feeling right now. And they go, okay, sounds good. I'll give you a call tomorrow. And they'll call you tomorrow. And they'll say, hey, how'd it go? Someone that's not going to judge you, but they're going to be there to walk with you and pray for you. And the coolest thing about accountability partner is this. When you let the secret temptation or the sin that's on your heart right now, you release it to someone else. The power of that sin no longer has hold on you. It no longer has a hold. You'll go from feeling that temptation to go, I'm relieved because I know someone else is there for me. It's no longer in darkness. The light, the truth has been brought in. You free yourself from bondage of sin. If you're struggling with something, you go, I know this is an issue and I know I need help. And you free yourself from it. You repent and you walk towards spiritual maturity. You get a mentor in your life. Someone maybe that's been walking in their faith a little longer, someone who's a little stronger in God's word. And you just say, hey, every few weeks, can we just grab coffee? Can we just talk about life? And you look for them to pour life into you, to speak God's word over you. And then on top of it, you don't just get a mentor, you become a mentor to someone. Maybe someone who's a little farther behind in their journey. And you start to mentor them. The way I've grown the strongest in my faith over my life is because I learned to start investing in someone else. And I didn't have all the answers, but I was able to say, God loves you. God's here for you. I'm here for you. I'm going to walk through this with you. So you find a mentor. You become a mentor. And you realize that your walk with God is not about perfection. It's about consistency. You screw up once. Who cares? There's always tomorrow and God's waiting there right there for you. Number two, you become a repairer of the breach in your marriage. You start every day praying for your wife. Every single day when I get out of bed, I get on my knees next to my bed and I start praying for my friends, the people closest to me, the people that mean the most to me, the person I love. I cover them in prayer for their day. I want them to know that when they go forth in that day, they've already been covered in prayer. How beautiful would that be for your wife to know that she's still sleeping and you're on the side of her bed praying over her day, covering her in the word of God with the armor of God before she even wakes up. You read scriptures together. If you have a TV in your room, can I just encourage you, get rid of that thing. Put a Bible next to the stand. Literally, every night you go to bed at the same time, you pull out the Bible and you say, let's read God's word together. How intimate that is. You listen to understand. You don't listen to respond. Guys, let me tell you something. Women, 99% of the time, just want us to listen. They don't want our advice. You guys can laugh. The guys can laugh. <laughs> they just want us to listen. And when we respond, when we counsel our wives, we don't counsel them with our own wisdom. We counsel them with the word of God. We wash the word of God over them. We put biblical community around our spouse, around our marriage. We never stop pursuing our wives. And anytime we think something good about our wife, we say it. Anything we, anytime we think something special about them, we do it. And anytime we want something different, we be it first. Number three is this. We become repairs of the breach for our children. There's this old saying that says, there are really no bad students, there are just bad teachers. We cover our kids in prayer constantly. That morning when you get up and you pray for your wife, pray for your child before they leave. 
before you walk out the front door with them, maybe just take 30 seconds to pray for them. That memory you're going to leave in their life. You listen to hear them. You be present with your children. You give them your eyes when they speak to you. When they say, dad, 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 mom, 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 instead of just what? Look at them. Give them your eyes. They're going to know the memory of the way that you looked at them with your eyes for the rest of their lives. Every time I spoke to my dad, he just looked at me. He gave me his full attention. Nothing in the world mattered. How powerful that is. Not only are they going to see your love for them, they're going to see God's love through you for them. You talk about God together with them. You lead by example. You teach them what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And you date your children. Use it a different word, whatever. You date your children. You show them what they should be looking for in a spouse one day. Because here's the deal. If you don't, the world will. And we know how that ends up. Parenting is not about perfection. It's about your presence. Continual presence. In Isaiah 12, it says, Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer in the streets in which to dwell. So I ask us this question this morning. What kind of legacy am I leaving? What am I going to do to change my legacy from secular to sacred? If we are going to be repairers of the breach around us, we must first start with ourselves. We must be willing to look inwards at our own heart and go, God, there's something not right. God, help me. God, teach me. Allow your word to overcome me, overwhelm me, so that I learn to go, this isn't right. This isn't what you had for me. And I learn to turn, to repent, to turn 180 and start to realign myself back to you. In the next moment, we're going to go into some prayer. And then the worship team is going to finish with a song. But I want to invite the elders to come up. And we're just going to spend some time in prayer. But I want to encourage you just for the next moment to be the most vulnerable you're willing to be. To open up your heart to God, to say, God, this is me. This is the temptation. This is the sin. This is the struggle that has hold on me, the bondage I'm facing. And if we're willing to open up our hearts to that, my prayer is that you don't leave this door, leave this building with that on you today. That you free yourself from that in the name of Jesus. In Philippians 2, it says, the name of Jesus has power over every name. We can call on God to lift our burdens from us, to lift our sins from us. And so in this moment, we're gonna go into prayer. And I'll ask you if you would, just, just stand with me. And if you would, if you feel called, if not, that's okay, but just open up your arms, open up your hands. We say, come Holy Spirit. God, right now in this moment, would your spirit come upon us? God, if there's something we're carrying today, would we not leave with it? When you say that your name is above all names, would we actually believe it? Would we be willing to call upon your name to say, God, free me from this? If we're struggling with the, with the sin, the bondage of, of pornography or lust or anger or a bitter heart, God, right now in the name of Jesus, would all demons flee? Would we release this to you, God? Would we say, God, you have power over every name? That I free my heart from this and that I trust that you can make my, my yoke light. You can take this burden from me. God, in a year from now, would we not be in the same place we are today? Would our yoke be a little lighter, our burdens be a little less, and our intimacy with you be a little closer. And so God, for your word, for your logos, 
and for the inspiration you pour upon us. Your Holy Spirit, would you convict us? Would we release these things to you, the struggles, the burdens, the bondage, the things that are holding us back from truly experiencing who you are and what you designed for us? God, would we put up the city walls that are supposed to protect us? God, and if those city walls right now, if they're broken, if there's a hole in that wall, would you give us the courage and the wisdom to know the right thing to do and the courage to do it, to say, I'm gonna rebuild that wall. I'm gonna rebuild that wall in my marriage. I'm gonna rebuild that wall in my family. It's my job to lead my family. Am I gonna rebuild that wall? And God, would you guide us as we do that? And so Holy Spirit, we trust you. We draw near to you. you. We know you are close to us and not far. And so God, this week, would you walk with us? Be with us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.